Robert. Megan. Hello, Robert. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, you know, beautiful afternoon here in Washington, D.C. It's not too bad in New Jersey either, uh, as New Jersey days go. Good. To, I haven't seen you in a while. You haven't been on Blogging Heads in a while, and also you left the Atlantic. I, I hope it's just a coincidence that it was just as I was showing up that you chose to leave the Atlantic, Megan, but for whatever reason. Well, that that's the public. Uh, that's my public message anyway. Yeah, it's well, total coincidence. I got the message. Um, so anyway, you're now at the Daily Beast. Uh, your, your blog, Asymmetrical Information. You know what we're going to do with this phone, Megan? We're going to throw it over there. <laughs> and it's going to be less loud there. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to talk about the fiscal cliff because, you know, I have not really been uh, paying attention to the fiscal cliff beyond the, the tax cuts part. I get the basic idea, but you've been following much more closely, so I just want you to, to give us a little... Uh, Primer on the fiscal cliff. I, I, I understand the part where Obama wants to restore tax rates to pre-Bush levels for the for upper income people. Republicans don't want to restore it for anybody. And Obama is trying to create a situation where either we, you know, they will be held responsible for, for raising the tax rates for everyone. Uh, I, I get that part. Mm -hmm. um, I I, I guess the big, ultimately the big question um, is going to be, and you wrote about this recently, like who who is who will suffer more? Which party will suffer more if they go over the fiscal cliff? Because that determines who is in the stronger bargaining position. And you you argue that it's not so clear that the Republicans suffer more from going over the cliff. But first, can you give us what is the conventional argument that you're arguing against for thinking that they will suffer more? Sure. Um, well, Republicans have taken more of a hit on these tactics. They definitely took a big hit on the debt ceiling uh, when they forced a showdown over it. Very popular with their base. Um, and I spent a lot of time arguing online with that base uh, saying, guys, it's not going to work the way you think it's going to work. You're just going to empower Democrats in a way that you don't want to for kind of no point. Um, which indeed turned out to be what happened. Um, they forced a showdown, they looked intransigent, Obama got to look reasonable, um, and then the deal that they ultimately did didn't actually get them very far. Mm -hmm. uh, this time around, it's a little bit different. So there's basically, there's three components of the fiscal cliff, right? There are um, basically the Bush tax cuts, uh, and we can divide those. The, there's not really a reason to, but this is how the Obama administration has done it. Uh, they were all passed as one package, but you can divide these into tax uh, hikes on or tax cuts that were for people who earn more than uh, $250,000 and tax cuts for people who earn less. Um, then there are these, uh, all of these sort of automatic cuts and, and so forth that were agreed to as part of the debt ceiling deal. Um, that stuff is going to take effect January 1st. The Bush tax cuts will expire January 1st. Um, and then there's a third question, which is all of the just long-term stuff that we've now been doing for practically forever. So for example, the alternative minimum tax was originally designed to deal with the problem of, I think there were like 200 very rich people who paid no taxes um, in the 70s and 80s. And so they, they put into place this alternative minimum tax, which basically says if your deductions add up to too much, we start taking them away mm -hmm. uh, so that you pay more tax. And the problem is that it was never indexed for inflation. And so every year the tax brackets go up and you're hitting more and more middle class people. Right. So when this was passed, someone who made $75,000 a year, you know, my dad, my dad in, in the 70s was making like $15,000 a year as an assistant to the mayor for the city of New York. Um, like $75,000 a year was a huge amount of money. Right. Um, he was supporting a family on that. And, and you know, now this is uh, – so now it's what, like, a fairly not doing that well middle-class family makes in lots of parts of the country. So is something set to happen with the alternative yes. minimum? So basically what has happened, uh, there's also these automatic cuts to doctor reimbursements that were put into place to try to control Medicare spending. Um, and what's happened is that when these things – threatened to actually really, really bite the doctors, you know, bite into doctor reimbursements, bite into middle class uh, incomes, then Congress passed a temporary fix and said, no, we won't let that happen this year. And then, of course, next year, the problem is even bigger, so you have to pass a, another fix. And at this point, the fixes are really large. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars 
over 10 years to fix these problems. Mm -hmm. uh, those are also scheduled to take place uh, January 1st. So most of this is taxes, a little bit of it is spending. Um, but that's where the Obama administration is seen to have kind of an edge, right? right? Democrats like higher taxes, and they can just allow all of these special tax breaks to expire. And then they're in a position where they can maybe offer selective cuts for just the people they like and force Democrats to take them. Because you start off assuming Democrats want higher taxes than Republicans do, since if nothing happens, all of those tax cuts go into effect. Uh, we think the Democrats are in a better position. There's another reason okay. that they're in a better can, can position. Can I clarify something? The fiscal sure. cliff per se is just about spending cuts, right? No, the fiscal it's cliff not. per se is actually mostly about taxes. Not so so that, about that's spending. in the fiscal cliff legislation is that if Congress, if they don't find a way to cut the deficit as much as that legislation demands, then the stuff that kicks in automatically right. it includes not just spending cuts but tax hikes, although although – Although the Bush, the pre, reverting to pre-Bush tax rates is a separate thing. That was just going to happen anyway, right? So that's the, the stuff that came as part of deals that were negotiated, um, you know, during the Obama administration with the fairly intransigent Republicans. That stuff uh, is, is more spending, and that is actually um, – uh, less, less spending. Pretty, uh, the fiscal cliff refers to all of it. The fiscal cliff is just that we're about to go over the situation where, on the one hand, Dem ah. on the one hand, the budget deficit closes. So great. Uh, it, it doesn't close entirely, but it gets much, much smaller. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the economy is still really frail. And as we go over and we're sucking, uh, the estimate is about $600 billion out of the economy uh, in a combination of tax cuts and spending, uh, sorry, spending cuts and tax hikes. Uh, then that pushes the economy into a recession. That is the fear. Yeah. So, so fiscal cliff is all of it, not just the spending. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Although, again, the the pre Bush tax thing is is kind of separate. But anyway, the point is, if they if they don't, sure, that is still part though of, of everything that's being included is the fiscal cliff. It, the the Bush all like okay. the AMP the the doc fix it's all part okay. of what the cliff will be, which is this massive fiscal. Uh, you know, anti-stimulus. Now, here, here's one thing I'm not clear on. If does the legislation say that to avoid the fiscal cliff, they have to close the deficit by as much as the fiscal cliff would close it? So, in other words, will the kind of fiscal drag imposed on the economy in conventional Keynesian terms, roughly speaking, the aggregate fiscal drag be the same either way? Okay, so here is... Uh, so on the sequestration part, where we have legislation saying you have to either do these really dumb, crude, instant cuts, or you have to find, I mean, they're just across, uh, lots of across the board cuts and things with no mm -hmm. discretion or planning, um, which was all they could really negotiate given the short time that they're doing this, they're right up against um, a crisis. So that stuff... Um, is you have, you're supposed to offset it, right? The way that you, you're supposed to find bigger savings elsewhere and then you don't do this. That was the idea of it, is you're essentially kind of negotiating by yourself by putting a gun to your own head and saying, look, I'll do it. Um, so, so, so total spending cuts would be the same regardless of whether they go over the cliff or not. Yeah, but you can change the timing, hmm. right? So you could, you could pick different things. You could say, well, we'll do, you know, we'll, we'll do a structural deal on entitlements. I mean, Congress and all, can, this is always the problem with this sort of legislation. Uh, I think with Graham Rudman's hauling, which was Graham Rudman Hollings, which was the original uh, one of these kind of bills in an attempt to force for Congress to force itself at some point in the future to balance the budget. Uh, P.J. work likened it to trying to quit smoking by hiding your cigarettes from yourself and then putting a, a note in your pocket to tell you where, where they were. Um, that, in fact, Congress can never bind itself in the future, and it certainly can't bind future Congresses. So the fact is they could just go in and be like, just kidding. Right. Uh, I'm not going to do any of it. And, you know, the, the hope is that they find cuts, that they do kind of a sustainable reform to, say, entitlements, uh, that offsets the cuts, but puts them, has them taking place more gradually and not when the economy is so fragile. Okay. Here's uh, another question. <clears throat> leave, leave aside the question of, of, like, who gets the political blame, of which side loses, 
in that sense. Which side loses in the event that they go over the fiscal cliff in terms of whose actual uh, budgeting priorities are hurt more? Right. Which ideology suffers more? I mean, for example, we we tend to think that defense cuts are, would bother Republicans more on ideological grounds. Uh, so if you look at all this stuff that gets cut, and I know it's it's very it's it's outlined very crudely. It's like you know this this the cuts are not very finely specified. But but to the extent that you can tell, which side would have more to lose in that sense? So I think it's a little hard to separate from political, and here's why. Um, if we go over the cliff, Republican priorities take a bigger hit. Mm -hmm. It's not only the defense cuts, it's that you're doing a massive tax hike and you're doing no entitlement reform. What about, I heard Met, uh, Medicaid gets hit, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's not. I mean, and, and that's a Democratic priority. But what you really want is kind of, there's domestic spending stuff, but what you really want is structural entitlement reform. You want something that actually makes it difficult going forward you know, both sides at this point are trying to lock in. Um, they're trying to lock in their policy references long term, and the way that you do that is by putting in structural programs that are really, really, really difficult to dismantle. Um, and you know, the Bush tax cuts are an example of that. It's actually now really hard to take that away from the middle class, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, Obamacare. The idea was once you enacted it, you would never politically be able to get rid of it. Um, so from that point of view, I think it's very clear that the Republicans just, I mean, you've got a massive tax hike, just massive tax hike. Um, it hits the rich especially hard because you've got a state capital and uh, state capital gains, but it, it hits everyone. Mm -hmm. You've got defense cuts. You've got no structural entitlement reform. So that's a big hit for Republicans. However, um, the very fact of it, I, I actually think sort of counterintuitively would be very bad for Democrats because what happens, okay, so we think the economy goes into recession. That's the consensus of most economists is that, so now, first of all, middle class taxpayers are really angry and maybe they're short term angry at Republicans, um, but their taxes are higher. And then you've got um, the double whammy of there's a recession. So their incomes are lower. you got a lot less, I think, structural room to kind of mitigate that recession than you did the last time around. You've destroyed Obama's reputation for being able to save the economy such as it was, right? I mean, it's really hard at this point to say, well, this is all Bush's fault too. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact is the guy in the Oval Office gets the, blame for the, gets the blame for recessions, fair or not. Obama got lucky because the last guy in the White House has gotten the blame for the recession that we had. But the next one I think he owns. Um, and also, what do, how exactly are Democrats going to go out and sell this message? I've been curious about this. Defense cuts and tax hikes kill the economy. That's going to be their stump speech in 2016, where you blame it all on Republicans. I find it hard to believe that that is going to be a winning message, because in fact, that is, it's, it's, it's defense cuts. The, like the bulk is defense cuts, tax hikes, and then some. Okay, so your scenario is, if they go over the fiscal cliff, it causes another recession and Obama gets blamed for that. That's why he has more to lose. Although, of course, he's not running for re-election, but I guess you're saying the Democrats get blamed for it. Take that hit, not the Republicans, because it, it just, we like over and over again, you see it's just identified with the person in the White House and people know that this started under Bush and so it's been identified with him. But having a second one in five years, mm -hmm. it then gets very hard to say, well, you know, we were here and then we we're there and now we're here again. But this, you know, now here again, but this this part here, that's that's also Bush's fault. I mean, All Bush this gets to why I, I ask, is the aggregate uh, hit the economy takes in fiscal terms the same either way? Because if it is, if it is, then look, Obama, then whatever to the whatever extent there's going to be a recession, there's going to be one. But what you're saying is, no, if they can reach a deal, then, you, you know, you could you could wind up with, yes, the equivalent in spending cuts but without all the tax hikes. And so the economy would be less likely to go into a recession for which Democrats would be blamed. Spending cuts that happen in, on a different time. Uh, oh, okay. Also less immediately painful spending cuts. Eventually all of this stimulus has to come out of the economy, right? We can't run into $1 trillion deficit forever, but the hope is that you do it when the economy is, is strong enough to take the hit. Um, and, you know, unemployment still hovering right around 8%. We're not in good shape. We've got a lot of people who have been out of work for a long time. So having another recession right now would be pretty bad. Okay. Um, but I do. Uh, 
Okay, I, I get. It. I mean, so so it, and it is it really widely widely accepted view that there would there would be another recession um, that, that it would be that painful. Yeah, because um, on the one hand, you know, the the Keynesians who not all Keynesians are Democrats by any means, but it, it slightly, you know, I mean, the the like non Keynesians tend to be overrepresented among conservative ranks. Um, the Keynesian idea is that stimulus is stimulus. I mean, some kinds of stimulus may be somewhat more stimulative than others. And so things like, uh, you know, food stamps may provide more stimulus per dollar mm -hmm. than a tax cut. But a tax cut is also stimulus. The stimulus is mm -hmm. created by the government borrowing money and pumping it into the economy one way or the other. Um, and there's not that much difference. So... You know, most of the, the kind of traditional economists are all saying the same things. And then the, the schools that you might expect to be saying, no, 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 uh, stimulus doesn't work. Well, the thing is that the by far the largest part of this, this fiscal cliff is tax hikes. And all of those schools think that tax hikes tend to be bad for the economy. So pretty much everyone is in agreement that this is going to be bad for the economy. So the, 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 the tax hikes are bigger than the spending cuts? Because the Bush tax cuts are enormous. Uh huh. Um, although m most of that, as you would probably point out, and as I think is true, is actually not upper income taxpayers. It's about uh, it's about a quarter of the money goes to people who make more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, Which is not the, nothing. No, it is not nothing, but it is not the bulk of it. The bulk of the money goes to people who make less than that. Mm -hmm. um, it still does seem to me in terms of the allocation of blame. I mean, I take your point that maybe three, four years down the road, if there's, if there's, at that point, a bad economy, you know, get, gets blamed on the incumbent, partly because everyone will have half forgotten about this particular episode. But by then, on the other hand, if you look a year and a half down the road, which congressional candidates care about more than the president cares about, right? This whole episode will still be fresh in everyone's mind. And it does seem to me, if the conventional wisdom is that the failure to get a deal killed us, and the Democrats can depict the sticking point, as they seem to be doing successfully so far, the sticking point as being the Republican refusal to, to give the upper class a tax hike, if they can make that case, uh, it seems to me that in the near term, a year, year and a half down the road, the Democrats are in a pretty strong position politically. I, you know, I think so. But then there's also the kind of, this counterintuitive kind of argument, right? You're, you're talking about mostly people who are going to get in trouble with people in their base, right? And now the base hates tax hikes. So uh, you assume that the Republicans are going to get in trouble for that. But you know, they can go out and say, President Obama was willing to do this rather than give us a quarter of the tax hikes that we wanted because these are tax cuts, uh, tax hikes that are going to destroy jobs. Um, and that's not an ineffective message. Um, you know, I think the, the counterweight to that is, of course, that I think that there is public support for, for these uh, raising taxes on higher earners. Um, I think that that itself is doing that is going to have some anti-stimulative effect. Um, but, you know, the, the Republicans at this point have actually proven more flexible than, than the Democrats have. In what sense? Uh, well, they're saying, OK, we'll do revenue. We're not going to do it. Well, they're saying uh, we'll do revenue. They're not saying we'll do rates. But revenue is a big move for them. It, well, uh, well, that's just a testament to how extreme they were. I mean, the flip side is, why do you care so much about doing rates? Why does it matter well, so much? Why does the rate have to go up? I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why, because... If you agree in print, if you agree, okay, the Bush tax cuts, we will, we will revert to pre-Bush levels for the upper class. It's very clear what that means. If you say, well, we'll do revenue through some sort of loophole closing, that means the, the following. Not a goddamn thing, right? That by itself means nothing, okay? So, what do you mean? Like, I, I, I just mean it's too vague. It's purpose of taxes is to raise revenue. I don't think it's... No, I, I understand. You can, you can reach, you can ultimately specify uh, ceilings on deductions and other loophole closing that gets you as much money as the tax hike does and afflicts the wealthy, whom I'm happy to see afflicted. You can do it. I'm just saying that 
that there's no there's no uh, you know weasel room. If they will, if the Republicans will sign on the, the dotted line on that tax hike, we know exactly what that means. You know, it's it's X percent tax hike. Whereas, whereas if they say, in other words, what they've said so far is nothing. Is what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm not saying it couldn't evolve into something. I'm just saying it's nothing. This is really interesting because you're making exactly the argument that uh, Republicans make as to why they're not going to do the tax hikes. Um, what they're say, what they say, and is I think true, uh, is that in the past when they have agreed to tax hikes, they got tax hikes immediately and the spending cuts were all these kind of vague, we'll do this in the future, and then they didn't happen. And that's why they're not moving, because the Democrats want to do that again. And in fact, indeed, it's true. Like all of the, well, maybe we'll do this and maybe later and we'll, you know, there's this tiny little thing that maybe we're willing to touch that in fact, um, the Democrats want the tax hikes now and the spending cuts later, and they don't want to do that deal. So you're, in fact, actually making the Republican argument. Uh, I don't know how, like, politically compelling that is. But emotionally, what they feel like is, look, we've been down this road many times before, and every time we give up tax hikes, uh, you guys promise spending cuts, and all we get is the tax hikes. Yeah, although this time around, they know that one way or another, there are going to be spending cuts. I mean, either either they will they will be cuts that the Republicans agree to, or they will be these other cuts. But but look, I take your I take your point. Both both sides try to eliminate the wiggle room for the other. I'm just saying, from my side, if you ask, why am I not delighted that the Republicans have said, well, in principle, we can see revenue increases. I'm saying I'm not delighted because that amounts to almost nothing by itself. Well, but I mean, that's also true in the spending. So if you're going to say that that's a legitimate reason to to force them to do something with the wiggle room, then they're kind of entitled to be as intransigent and demand structural entitlement reform this minute uh, that is going to make it really. So that's I mean, that is what the Republican side is urging is saying, like, no, we do this now. We raise the entitlement right? We raise the retirement age. Uh, we raise uh, the Medicare age. We means test and we put that stuff and we cut eligibility for various programs and we do that right now. And if you do that, we'll talk about tax hikes. But Democrats don't actually seem to think that's or, fair. I mean, if each side insists on the other going first, it may never happen. The alternative, of course, is they get together in a room without the media and do a deal and announce it all simultaneously. Right. I mean, I, I think the, the answer is that if you actually want to get a deal, that's what the deal is going to look like, is we're going to do tax hikes that are structural and happen now. I like I personally think that the tax tax rates have to go up. Um, but I also think that, you know, Obama can't offer, well, two years from now, maybe we'll think about doing some vague cuts that I'm not going to be too specific about. But right now, you guys, like, when I am totally 100% insisting and will not budge on doing tax, I mean, like, rate hike, if he's really serious about that, then indeed, yes, uh, he, there's more chance that we're going to go to the fiscal cliff because Republicans, fair or not, um, you know, probably feel that they have more to lose from doing that kind of a deal. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that's entirely unfair that they feel they have more to lose from doing that kind of a deal than just letting us go over the cliff. Here's one thing I've been uh, wondering, and this speaks partly to my utter ignorance of the actual pr pr way Congress works. But uh, like I assume that since the, the Republicans control the House, the, Dem it, the Democrats cannot get a bill to uh, to you know lower tax rate or keep tax rates for the middle class low. They can't get that bill actually introduced, right? I mean, they, I mean, they can't get it to the floor. They can't, they can't put the. I mean, I would think if they could put the Republicans in the position of having to vote for or against it, it would be game over. But, but I don't think they can, right? And so that's why I'm not. It's not so clear to me that the Democrats win this, win this in the court of public opinion. I think that uh, it would take some sort of widespread revolt that I'm not sure is brewing uh, among. The, among Demo uh, among Republican backbenchers. I mean, like, you could right. sketch out a scenario where they overthrow by John Boehner or force him to do it, but uh, it doesn't seem that likely, no. Um, even more likely in the Senate. Uh, but Well, the Senate has done that. The Senate has already passed this tax cut for the middle class, right? Uh, it's, I'm not sure whether it's passed, but yes, they are. They, they're on they, board. Uh Okay, so what are you hearing? You're you're actually in Washington. Like, are you hearing? Do you have a sense for what's going to happen? People here are more pessimistic than they were a month ago. That's the sense I have. Um, 
And I think that that's not without reason. And in part because a month ago, what people said is the Republicans lost and they're going to move. And they were right. What they didn't anticipate was that Republicans lost, the Republicans were going to move and be more flexible. And then the Democrats would be like, great, now we need to double down. Um, <laughs> and so it's, you know, like as, as, as conservatives have gotten a little more flexible, Democrats have decided maybe it's not so bad for them if they go over the fiscal cliff and that, that might give them more leverage and, uh, and just more broadly that Obama has a mandate to raise these tax rates. Um, you know, my opinion is if you're going to do a little deal, just do a little deal and accept that you're not going to get much and you're also not going to give much. My take on, on at least the current stance of offers is that the Obama administration has demanded to get a lot in exchange for giving up very little. Um, yeah, well, I think they think they're in the stronger position and that's the way bargaining works. They may be wrong, but I think, you know, that's that's what they think. I also think it, it's it's not necessarily that they're saying, okay, we can go over the fiscal cliff. There's also this intermediate c scenario, right, where you go over it, you go past January, but you still have time to actually basically not go over it. The problem, too, though, is that I think that there is this kind of folk wisdom among policymakers, uh, not policymakers, uh, rather among like the, the kind of progressive uh, base about how negotiating should work, mm -hmm. is that, well, you know, we don't like this deal we got, so we should have asked for something twice as extreme, and then we could have gotten the thing that we started by asking for. It doesn't actually work that way, right? There's a zone of possible agreement, and you can't move the other side outside of what they're willing to agree to merely by doubling down and asking for twice as much. And in fact, in the real world, if you do that, you often alienate the person you're negotiating with. You make them angry. And then they just say, okay, well, to hell with you. I guess I will take my ball and go home. Um, I think there is a slight danger that um, obviously no one really knows what's going on right now. So I, I, I want to temper this by saying I just don't know. But, you know, right after the election, I was hearing um, a fair amount of, okay, we lost. That happened, you know. Um, I think there is some danger, and this is a bit of tea leaf reading, that the Democrats, by overplaying their hand, may have uh, firmed up the backbone of Republicans who were beginning to weaken, and that they may go back to full frontal crazy mode, and that we'll go over the and we'll really just go. Um, and you know, that being in a stronger negotiating position does not mean that it's necessarily a good idea to uh, say, well, here, offer, take it or leave it, because they actually have the, the offer of leave it, and that makes you much worse off, which I think is, you know, no matter who you think is going to kind of win this situation, Democrats are way worse off if they go over the fiscal cliff and if we stay there. Than Republicans? Than they are now. Well, there's, there's two ways to look at that. I mean, <clears throat> and between, between the Democratic and Republican Party, it's a zero-sum game. You can't say they both lose. Now, on the other hand, if you look at the individual inhabitants of office, the incumbents, it's actually not a zero-sum game because Democrats and Republicans would rather all of them stay in office, the individual human beings, than that none of them stay in office. So at the level of human motivation, yes, it's, it, it, it's a non-zero-sum uh, game, but in terms of partisan advantage, one, you know, in terms of which party winds up with more seats two, four, six years down the road, they can't both lose. Yes, that's true in election. But most of these guys didn't just get elected because they admired the fine wooden, wooden paneling in their, their congressional offices, right? They came here presumably to do something. If we have a recession, nothing happens. Obama's, Obama's second term is going to consist of being Jimmy Carter and everyone saying, like, he's now had eight years, and really, he can't get the economy back going. He sucks. I hate him. Uh, Democrats, who presumably want to do stuff, aren't going to get anything done. Republicans are going to be in huge trouble uh, and also not get anything that they want. I mean, if you have a recession, all of this stuff, presumably you care about things, right? Military spending has to go down because there's no money. All of the, the kind of temporary extenders we've had on payroll tax and food stamps, I think are harder to do this time around so people suffer. Um, you know, the agenda that they are presumably here to enact does not get enacted if we go over the fiscal cliff and stay there. It is a brutal short, like somewhat short, 
but a brutal recession that really destroys a lot of the stuff that these guys are presumably planning for the next few years. Of course, what they'd probably do around, do, do is turn around and, if they went over the cliff, actually cut taxes immediately. And it would certainly be legal to do to restore the taxes fully to, to pre-Bush levels, or at least do that for the middle class. I think that that's true. Um, I think they would, again, run into difficulty bringing that bill to the floor in the House. I am by no means an expert on Senate or House procedure, so, you know. The, the, yeah. um, and so what, just quickly, what is the main, besides defense, where do the spending cuts hit? There's, it's, it's a bunch of just across the board, you know, these programs I'll take, a, I, I would have to look up okay. with you. And on defense, this is my final thing. This is, uh, I'm thinking about, right, just, just kind of writing this, that, okay, it may be that if you cut defense spending this much, it's a huge hit on the economy. But does anyone really believe that, like, even if you slash the defense budget, well, yes, yeah, some people do believe this, but I mean, do reasonable people believe that even if you slash the defense budget, it would actually make America less secure? I mean, what, what the Pentagon is supposed to do is keep America secure. And the truth is, the major Pentagon initiatives, in my view, the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War, have actually made us less secure. So it's like, what, what would actually happen to the military budget that would actually make us like more likely to get attacked or something? Well, what would that be? Well, I think... Again, I am so far from a defense expert that I can only kind of repeat what I have heard from people who are defense experts, which is that the real problem with these cuts is, again, they are blind, stupid cuts. They are, you're doing instant cut, you're doing immediate cuts. They're not, um, you know, it's not like you sit down and spend 18 months figuring out if you want to reconfigure a smaller force that's going to meet the challenges of the 21st century. It's that you just walk into an office and say, okay, fire all these people. Okay, but they are right now unspecified. So so if the person who makes a decision is sufficiently judicious, they actually could be wise cuts, right? But you don't have time to, you know, there's lots of things that you do if you have a lot of time to think about them. I mean, part of this that no one's even, as, as I understand it, uh, again, not a defense expert, but even the kind of the planning you would want to have been done for this has not been done, and Obama has said these cuts are not going to take place. Um, he has? So, yeah. Well, what, uh, how can he do like they have to take place? He has promised they won't. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I, so I think that, I don't think many people do think that defense cuts will take place, uh, but who knows at this point? I mean, Washington is getting more and more toxic. People get more, and it's a cycle. But wait, if the defense cuts won't take place, what you're saying is the fiscal cliff is totally fake. I mean, either the cliff is real or it's not. But the, it's very clear that if you go over the cliff, you're supposed to cut the Pentagon budget by X amount, right? First of all, I, I don't know that Obama can meet that assurance. Right. But second of all, most of the fiscal cliff is, is the tax hikes. It's just most it, most of it is really large uh, increases in the tax burden from payroll tax alternative. So you know we've had this payroll tax uh -huh. cut that experience, alternative minimum tax, the Bush tax cuts, some capital stuff, um, sure. all of that at it once. Yeah, but the defense cuts in the aggregate are unambiguously specified in the, in the Cliff legislation, right? But as like my understanding is, is that just it's just percentages. It's just you have to do an across the board cut. Right. Yeah. So, yes, in the same way that like you know I tried to explain this to to Republicans during the debt ceiling, where they would say, um, well, you know, it's good that we're going to shut this down because we're, we just borrowed too much money, and we should just stop. And I said, look, here's where the deficit is, right? And like let, let's walk through the top things. And once you had done veterans benefits, payroll and housing for military families, um, Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, which is all stuff they said they weren't going to touch, it was pretty much it. I mean, you, you ran out of money somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. So what I, I said, what are you going to do? You're just going to strand everyone in Afghanistan? Like, that's it? <laughs> you leave them there? Not give them airfare home? Yeah. That stuff that, you know, that... that if you were going to say, okay, we're going to draw down the troops, we're having a planned withdrawal, but you can't, there's stuff that you can't cut because it you can't just say, okay, well, guys in Iraq, sorry about that. Uh, I'm sure the Continental will be happy to fly home as soon as your family wires you the money, and also you're discharged, right? You can't do that. There's a lot of stuff that's really, really hard. 
to implement that way, which means that other stuff has to take a heavier hit. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you had three years to think about it, you would plan it better. Yeah. Okay. Well, I do understand this better. And, 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 and I'm not more optimistic now that I understand it better. So you've, you've, uh, you've, your work here is done. So thank you for taking the time, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Wright. It was good to speak to you, as always. Yeah, and uh, maybe come back and, and after things uh, unfold disastrously, come back and remind us that this is consistent with your predictions. I don't know that. I, I should say, I'm not 100% certain that we're going to go over. I just think that the risk is higher than it was a month ago. I think that a month ago people thought that there was going to be more movement and that both sides seem to have really dug in and, and are, we're just back in that toxic Washington dynamic of everyone hating everyone else as hard as they possibly can. Yeah, well, it's a living. I'm predicting a deal by March 1st. I think that's probably more likely than not. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Megan. Have a good day, Robert. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.